Hi everybody, this is Joanne Manister, Science Goddess on Twitter, with my co-host Jeff Schomeyer of Read Science. And uh, today we welcome Jason Fagoni, who has um, written a marvelous book, one that I could not put down uh, when I got it. It's called The Woman Who Smashed Codes, A True Story of Love, Spies, and the Unlikely Heroine Who Outwitted America's Enemies. And uh, yes, I look forward to a discussion with you, Jason. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So let, let's uh, talk a little bit about you. You are an American journalist and author. Your work has appeared in GQ, Wired, Esquire, The Atlantic, New York, New York Times, Huffington Post, and more, more. And you have two other books. Your first book has two names I saw. One is Horsemen of the Esophagus about competitive eating, but what's the alternate title? Was that in the UK or something? Uh, I think it was called Insatiable. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, maybe it's really, you know, I mean, people have asked me if there's uh, something that links that book about competitive eating with this book that I wrote about uh, puzzle solving heroine of the world wars. And the answer is no. No. There's, no. there's nothing. There's nothing that connects them other than the fact that uh, that I wrote them. That you thought, wrote them. Yeah, and then. Them. And then your other book, your second book, uh, before this one, is called Ingenious, A True mm -hmm. Story of Invention, Automotive Daring, and The Race to Revive America, about teams in the Progressive Automotive X Prize. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, that's getting a little bit closer to the topic of uh, the woman who smashed codes. We're, we're now, now with Ingenious, we're talking about science, we're talking about engineering, and we're talking about building things, which is uh, very much sort of the spirit at the heart of um, the book we're going to talk about today. Ah, that's good. I'm going to let Jeff ask his question because he normally gets to ask the first question, but now I thought of one I need to ask you. So, <laughs> Jeff, take it away. I'm writing my question down. <laughs> okay. Okay. You've, you've given us here a really interesting, very comprehensive uh, written and researched biography of a woman that nobody's ever heard of up until now. And I think the, the, the question underneath here that I'm really interested in is hearing about your research and, and stories about that. What I'm particularly interested in is what things happened that made it possible to do the research now, which is tied pretty much to why we have never heard of Elizabeth Friedman before. But I think maybe to start, I might have to say, can you give us the quick sketch of who she is and what she's done, just, just enough to start hanging these these details on about why we've never heard of her yet. Yes. So Elizabeth Friedman is, um, I think, one of the most important Americans that most people have never heard of. Mm -hmm. um, she helped invent the modern science of cryptology, uh, codes and ciphers, that is at the foundation of our uh, powerful intelligence agencies. So the NSA, CIA, FBI, at, at the core of these agencies is the science of cryptology. And Elizabeth was one of the pioneers of, of this science um, in the early 20th century. She, she also used that science to do uh, a series of incredibly dramatic things. For instance, during the, uh, the 20s and 30s, she intercepted and solved encrypted radio messages that were sent by rum runners and Ooh. drug smugglers. And so she was basically fighting the rum war uh, using her knowledge as a code breaker. Excuse me. And, uh, and then in World War II, she used her abilities to uh, hunt Nazis, particularly Nazi spies. Uh, she intercepted and solved the uh, encrypted radio messages of Nazi spies, helped destroy these rings, uh, eliminated dangerous threat to America during the war. And, um, and then all of that time, she was also the uh, sort of the life uh, partner, helpmate and, uh, and muse of a guy who later became very famous, a guy who is uh, considered to be the founder of the National Security Agency, a guy named William Friedman. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that behind the, um, uh, the story of the American intelligence community, it's, its growth and its rise, there's actually this remarkable uh, hidden woman, a, a code-breaking Quaker poet that nobody had ever heard of. And for, for me as a journalist and a writer, to, to find a story like that, to kind of stumble on it in the way that I did, is uh, one of the best things that, that can possibly happen to you. She's been we don't know her because she's been subjected to so many different types of suppression. She sure. was she was the one doing all of these things. Uh, and I 
I think you've convinced me that she's really the stronger, more creative uh, of the partnership with her husband, even though her husband did important things on his own. Uh, but you you tell had a telling story about people who would come and try to talk to her, hoping that she would talk to her husband, so they thought, in order to solve some problems. But really, she was the one doing it. And so she's subjected to these, what we now see as horribly sexist preconceptions that said, you know, just she could not be the one who was doing anything and it must be her husband. Plus the fact that virtually everything she did is classified and extremely secretly, secretly handled and everything up until very recently, right? So it's only, as, as the headlines of my say, it's only now that this story can start to come out and we can start to see who this incredible person was, right? This right. is yes. all this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Jeff, you put your finger on the two things that have made her story uh, hidden for so many years. One thing is sexism and the other uh, thing is secrecy. And so on the sexism front, you know, all through her career, she was surrounded by men who ended up getting the credit for things that that she did and, and contributed to. And sometimes it was just because there were men close to her who she loved who who ended up overshadowing her because mm -hmm. of the sexism of the culture. As this is the case with her partnership with William Friedman. Um, and in other cases, they were men who were powerful men who actively uh, stole credit uh, mm -hmm. from her for things that uh, that she did. I mean, the most famous case of this is is the thing that I, I, I discovered in the book, which is, you know, she was essentially the technical engine, mm -hmm. the secret weapon in World War II for J. Edgar Hoover in his hunt for Nazi spies in the Western Hemisphere. And yet, after the war, we can talk more about this later if you want, mm -hmm. uh, Hoover kind of... Hoover took the credit for for uh, for her accomplishments and her feats of code breaking, but um, but yeah, I mean, so so um, beyond the sexism, she was working on incredibly secret projects, um, especially during World War II, that uh, were locked in government tombs for about fifty or sixty years. They were classified. I mean, I, when I found finally found after a two year search, the records, uh, the now declassified records of her World War II code breaking unit. Right every page uh, I, that had um, this big fearsome looking black stamp at the top that said uh, top secret ultra and yeah. uh, every, every single page top secret ultra ultra was one of the biggest uh, secrets of the war and so um you know for for the longest time we didn't know the story because it was uh literally hidden under lock and key but i think that um uh like you said um you know, initially, government agencies would approach Elizabeth with sort of a sexist uh, pitch. They would go to her, you know, hoping to use uh, the, the brain of the great William Friedman kind of secondhand because they knew that, that William and, and uh, Elizabeth had this kind of incredible intellectual bond. And yes. so, so they, they would try to get access to the, to the powerful sort of computer of William's brain by, uh, by, by leasing time in Elizabeth's brain. And uh, she resented that a little bit. You know, she, 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 she thought that was sad for her. But but the same thing happened every time, which is that, you know, after this kind of initial sexist pitch, Elizabeth would accept the job and, and go to work for government agencies mm -hmm. solving puzzles. And, and very quickly, the people that she was working with realized, oh, my gosh, she's a master in her own right. And then they'd give her more and more work. And she very quickly established herself um, as an expert wh wherever she went. And I mean, she was she was actually so good that it it uh, it ended up putting up impediments in her in her own life and her her own dreams because I mean you know she had other things that she wanted to do with her life other than work for the U.S. government she wanted yeah. to write children's books she had two kids and um, the problem was she was just so damn good at what she did I mean her her lifelong complaint was that uh, you know the way she put it is men from the government keep showing up on my doorstep <laughs> asking me to solve puzzles for America. The only, the only way I can make them go away is to say yes and solve these puzzles for them. And the problem for Elizabeth is just that she just had such an unusual set of skills that she became indispensable. And that became her life as men from the government showing up on her doorstep all the live long day. And she, and, and she you know, out of a sense of duty, uh, continuing to say yes. And that's what kind of drove her, uh, her incredible and uh, uh, remarkable career that mm -hmm. I think sort of changed the shape of the 20th century. I yeah, think it's clearly, uh, well, she, clearly she didn't start that way. She was a poet. And um, <laughs> I remember Jeff and I having a discussion of like, oh my goodness, the way this book starts, yes, you know, being sort of, 
you know, uh, almost yeah. accosted and picked up by well, an eccentric yeah. tycoon. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these things that's, uh, you know, tr truth is stranger than fiction, right? So uh, so it's, it's true. Elizabeth uh, was not, uh, I, I think we tend to think of code breakers as math geniuses. Um, you know, a code breaker is just someone who solves uh, a hidden message without having the key. And um, I, I think our image is, is that these are mathematicians. But the thing about Elizabeth is that she started as a poet. She was a literature expert. She had studied uh, uh, English literature at a liberal arts college, uh, you know, reading Shakespeare uh, plays and Tennyson poems. That was her thing. She, she loved the rhythm of words. And um, what happened is that, that she was a bright woman in, in 1915 when she graduated from college. And the only job that was available to women at that, at, at that time, really, was uh, to be a school teacher. That was kind of the end of the line. And, uh, and so she became a school teacher and f she found it incredibly boring. Uh, she, she got a job as a school teacher in a rural Indiana town, not far from the um, small Indiana town where she had grown up. And uh, she just wanted something more out of life. She wanted to take a risk. And she had kind of a, uh, an inner bravery and an inner sort of rebelliousness that, that uh, was not shared by her eight siblings and her large Quaker family. She was, she was kind of the rebellious one in the family. And so she decided, uh, you know, at age 23 to quit her job and move to the big city, Chicago, and look for, look for something more unusual. And this, and this crazy thing happened when she went there in June 1916, which is... You know, she 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 kind of struck out finding finding a new job. She went to job agencies. Nobody seemed to have anything. And um, she, right before she was about to go home to Indiana uh, in failure, she stopped at a, a library, the Newberry Library, which happened to have a rare volume of Shakespeare that she had always wanted to see. It was the 1623 uh, first folio, which was the first time that Shakespeare's plays had all, all been collected. She goes to this library and she's looking at this rare book of Shakespeare and the librarian comes over to her and says, looks like you're interested in Shakespeare. And Elizabeth says, yes, I'm very interested in Shakespeare. And the librarian says, you know, it's a funny thing. There is this, there's this very odd rich guy who has been coming to the library a lot lately. And he's, look, he's been looking uh, with extreme uh, care, poring over the pages of the same book that you're looking at now. He thinks that there are hidden messages in the works of Shakespeare that have been written in cipher by the true author who is actually not William Shakespeare. He thinks. He thinks it's this guy, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, Francis Bacon. And the librarian is telling Elizabeth this. And the librarian says, um, you know, this odd rich guy he says he's looking for a research assistant. Would you be interested in a position like that? And, uh, and Elizabeth says, uh, oh, possibly. The librarian goes back to the desk, makes a phone call. And within an hour, this odd rich guy pulls up to the front of the library in a chauffeured limousine, comes, in, comes into the library, stands in front of Elizabeth Friedman. By the way, Elizabeth Friedman is like five foot three. She's very petite, uh, small, uh, delicate. This guy is six foot four, uh, 240 pounds, big iron gray beard, just towering over her. And the first thing he says to her is, would you like to come out to Riverbank and spend the night with me? <laughs> this really happened. Actually, she told the story many, many times, and it was always the same. It's accurate. Um, and she didn't know what to say. She said, um, "You know, I, I don't, I don't have any of my, she, I don't have any of my night things. I don't have my toothbrush." And he said, "Oh, don't worry about that. We'll provide all of that." And he grabbed her by the arm and took her into the limousine, <laughs> and, and it ended up ended up kind of taking her on the train out to this place called Riverbank, which turned out to be the setting for the first third of, of my book, The Woman Who Smashed Codes. It's, it's this kind of fantastical forgotten place um, that was created by uh, uh, a guy who was kind of like an Andrew Carnegie or a William Randolph Hearst of his day. He was a Gilded Age multimillionaire um, who had enough money to create kind of his own world around him. And that's, that's, where, that's where the book begins. And that's where Elizabeth's kind of adventure begins. Yeah, what a, what a surprise. And that was, uh, you started it off well, because that was what made it. I'm like, well, now I got to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, she felt the same way. She, she was kind of, she was a little bit of, she was offended. She was uh, sure. surprised, but there was something, it, her curiosity was triggered. I mean, when this, when this rich guy told her that he had assembled a group of experts from around the world to discover <laughs> secret messages in Shakespeare, and she's 23 years old, and she's been looking for, She's she's set out to look for a more unusual job. Well, she has found it. She has found <laughs> that it is more unusual, right? So her curiosity was piqued, and and she went along with the uh, with the game, and she she moved out there. She began working for this guy, 
and very quickly things got extremely strange. Strange. Yeah, it, it didn't disappoint. He was uh, George Fabian is just as weird as as he seemed at the very beginning, right? With this fanciful sort of movie set research place where he was doing his own things and yeah, it's so just I mean, too he, bizarre. It's it's he's like he's almost like a Donald Trump of his day, um, <laughs> except uh, you know, I mean instead of caring a lot about tv ratings he what what george fabian cared about was science he wanted to discover the secrets of nature that was his his personal passion that was how he spent all his all of his free time when he wasn't making a ton of money uh in the industry he was thinking about how to uh reveal the secrets of nature and and so his his 350 acre private estate outside of chicago called riverbank he turned it into kind of like half of a rich man's paradise and <laughs> half a private scientific laboratory. And so, um, you know, on any given weekend at Riverbank, there might be, you would have the rich guy part. You would have like Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt stopping by to talk about genetics and uh, agriculture, or you would have famous actresses of the day sort of sunning themselves on the lawn, Lily Langtree, right. Billy Burke. <laughs> Uh, and on the other hand, you would have all of these uh, amazing scientists running around performing uh, cutting edge experiments. He hired people uh, who were some of the leading acoustics experts of the mm -hmm. day from Harvard. He hired uh, uh, agriculture experts to uh, breed new strains of crops. And um, one of the people he had hired was this guy, a young Jewish uh, geneticist from Pittsburgh, William Friedman. Uh, in 1915, and then Elizabeth Friedman is hired in 1916, the following year, uh, to work on the Shakespeare project. Fairly soon, these two young people are thrown together, uh, and they and they immediately click. They have a bond, and and uh, within a year, they're married, and they are kind of off to the races. Um, soon to become the greatest uh, code-breaking duo in in history. Yeah, because so here's George Fabian, this wacko out here. Uh, but he knows people, he knows everyone, it seems like, who want to be known by him. And then World War I comes along, and then right. there are these secret messages, and somebody has a clever idea, and the U.S. has no code-breaking facility whatsoever. And so stuff happens, and before you know it, here's Elizabeth and, and William, who are saving the U.S. secretly from, from, the, from Germany, and... It's just too incredible. Stuff happens. I, I like that. That that really is like a pretty accurate, <laughs> accurate encapsulation of of, of that moment. Um, uh, yeah. So so this was a surprise to me researching the book is that um, you know America had no intelligence community to speak mm -hmm. of in 1916 when World War One broke out. I think today you know the FBI, CIA, NSA are so large and powerful um, that we we tend to think that they've always been that way. But none of that. You know, not at all. I mean, the surprise for me researching the book is that in 1916, there was almost nothing. There was no NSA. There was no CIA. And the FBI was only about eight years old. It wasn't very large or very powerful at all. And so uh, when World War I broke out, uh, America had no ability to read the secret messages of the enemy. It could not intercept the messages of the enemy and solve them and read them to get intelligence, which is what you need to do in a war. It's very important. And um, and. Uh, and because the, the War Department, the Army, was so desperate because they just didn't have anybody, they ended up turning to, yeah. to these kind of odd Shakespeare uh, investigators out at Riverbank because they, because they ha just happened to be some of the only people you know, who could read Elizabeth, secret messages. Yeah, they, who could read secret. I mean, Elizabeth said later that, that there were only about five people in, in the entire country yeah. in 1916 who knew any, who even knew what the word code or cipher meant. Mm -hmm. um, and so. The, the War Department, you know, out of desperation, began to send it all of its uh, secret messages to be solved out to the Illinois Prairie. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, this this uh, kind of odd literary project of finding secret messages in Shakespeare was transformed into a very urgent uh, military project of discovering what the Germans were saying. And uh, and that's how Elizabeth and, and William got their start as military codebreakers at age you know, 24, 25. It's, 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 it's an incredible thing. They were so young. Uh, but be, because the field itself was so young, they were, they were kind of the experts, even, even though they were uh, incredibly young. And, and was... they, they, you know, obviously when you're around someone who's sort of eccentric and odd and you realize, wait, there's more to life than this, you know, yes. so they had to get away somehow. 
Yeah, they, they eventually had to make, I, I think what happened is, uh, uh, you know, at a certain point, they realized that the Shakespeare project was a wild goose chase. It was all mm -hmm. kind of a, it was an instance of, you know, humans are, are very good at, at seeing patterns in, in noise. Mm -hmm. We're all kind of, um, we're all kind of born to do it. And um, uh, that's really what code breaking is more than anything. It's, it's about seeing patterns. And uh, the thing with the Shakespeare people is that they, they were seeing patterns that weren't really there. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes we're so good at seeing patterns that we see things that aren't really there. And uh, it, it was all kind of a delusion. I think Elizabeth and William looked at each other at some point and they just, they looked at each other and they just thought like, is everyone else around here completely <laughs> insane? Like, are, are we the only, is it possible that we're the only sane people in this entire, in this entire place? And, um, and that, that really bonded them to each other. And, um, and the fact that they, they began to challenge Fabian, he didn't like that. He was a very mm -hmm. controlling guy and um, he started to spy on them. He intercepted their, their personal mail. He surveilled them. <laughs> and uh and tried to exert control to prevent them from ever leaving so ultimately after the war was over after elizabeth and william spent the war serving america solving these german messages and also sort of inventing some of the early um uh pieces of what would become you know the modern science of cryptology writing these really important scientific papers together after the war they decided to uh uh essentially to to flee to to, to they packed up their things in the middle of the night yes. Uh, so that Fabian couldn't prevent them from leaving. And at the end of 1920, um, they lit out for Washington, D.C. to uh, to begin a new career together in the nation's capital. That and that sort of seemed like a story in itself. But no, that was that was where things were just just getting started. And then stuff happened. And then more stuff happened. <laughs> more yeah. stuff. And it kept happening. Yeah, it kept <laughs> happening. No, well, I mean Elizabeth. I mean, this is Elizabeth's. This is Elizabeth's sort of uh, constant refrain about her life. Is she described her career mm -hmm. in code breaking as her phrase "pure accident"? She yeah. never intended to to do any of this. It was just a series of a series of kind of historical accidents that kept flinging her into ever more kind of you know dramatic and high mm -hmm. stakes situations that she that she had to you know think herself out of. Now, but then in a while, we're going to find out how she ends up working, of all things, for the Coast Guard, which is like, yeah, take, takes yeah. half the book. And I was like, really? Yeah. But there's so much before there. And, and I'm thinking there, there were several times in the book when we sort of seemed to be over here doing background for what was happening with Elizabeth. And I was very happy about that because I found I kept saying, I didn't even know that. It's like yeah. I, had, I hadn't been aware of the whole thing about rum running and what an incredibly big operation what a serious operation that was right. so the background there was useful and one that struck me similarly was i don't think i knew about the whole nazi infiltration trying to form a yes, revolution yeah. in south america all of right. the radio networks yeah. it's like i had no idea about how right. important any of those things were but and I was going to say, this is one thing I was I really liked about this book was I love when books inform me of something. I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I've heard of it, but not very well informed about it. You know, so, like it's meant yeah. rum runner and you go, oh, yeah, I sort of know what a rum runner is. But so I've got the impression that Jason was hearing about these, learning was, about these yeah. things for the first time. And maybe that's useful not to know the subject uh, so well. You can be surprised by that. And well, for sure. I mean, I'm an outsider to, to the world of, of cryptology. I think I was approaching this always with an outsider's eye and, and learning myself, which is uh, part of what made it so, so much fun. And one of the reasons I love being a journalist and a writer is because it's kind of a way to, um, a way to constantly be teaching yourself new mm -hmm. things right? as, a, as a way of living. Without um, an exam or... Well, you always have a paper to write, but <laughs> well, you're always going to write. You got to show. You got to show your work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, ab absolutely, that's that's true about rum running. I mean, I I I think I had this impression, uh, hearing about rum running over the years. It, I had this impression of a rum runner as sort of like a gentleman, um, yeah. You know, a guy, a guy on a on a on a boat. Uh, doing it for the love of the love of being out in the fresh air and yeah. kind of the, the adventure of it, and you know, making a little bit of money on the side, and it's kind of a noble thing. And, and no, that's not a, that's not what it was at all. I mean, it, it was like that for the first couple of years of prohibition, but very quickly, what happened by about 1924 and 1925 is that cr you know vast criminal syndicates figured out there was there was enormous money to be made, and uh, and they forced the gentlemen rum runners out of business. 
um, if you've ever heard the phrase "the real McCoy," um, <laughs> that that's actually um, that actually dates back to rum running. There there really was a, a rum captain named Bill McCoy. He was kind of kind of the archetypal gentleman rum runner. And in his memoir, he talks about being forced out of the business by a criminal mafia from New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so so the gentlemen were the gentlemen were kicked out by the mob. And the mob approach to rum running was very much like the mob approach to anything else, which is you, you do it at scale, you do it with weapons, you do it with guns, you do it by killing people, you do it by intimidating people, you do it with uh, extortion and embezzlement and fraud. And, um, and these, were, these were criminal syndicates that, you know, by, by, the, by the middle part of the 1920s, encircled the entire globe. There was mm-hmm. one criminal syndicate in, in particular uh, based out of Vancouver, Canada, called Consolidated Exporters Corporation that essentially had it had its own it had essentially like a like a navy that would mm-hmm. have been the envy of many countries they had about 60 or 70 ships wow. that, that encircled the entire uh, globe and uh, and brought rum from uh, all parts of the world uh, west coast east coast uh, gulf of mexico there was nowhere that these ships were not and uh, they had about uh, 40 or 50 different codes and ciphers that were that were that were all very strong and changing all the time because they had enough money that they were able to hire a British uh, expert cryptographer who had uh, who had worked for the British Navy uh, during World War One. And so uh, when Elizabeth started to look at some of these rum running codes in, in the mid 1920s, when, when she first went to work for the Coast Guard, after the men from the government showed up on her doorstep and said, please help us. Yes. Uh, <laughs> You know, she's looking at these things for the Coast Guard and she's realizing, oh, my gosh, this is the, the sophistication level of these rum running codes is very high. And so um, so it took her a long time uh, to, to really kind of dig into these networks. But but eventually she did because she was she was extremely patient. She was extremely smart and um, and creative and uh, and tenacious. And and ultimately she was able to sort of draw a map of this hidden underworld she she was able to use code breaking um and radio intelligence uh, that is intercepting these radio messages that rum runners were sending um solving solving them decrypting the the encrypted messages and then reading the messages to learn what these rum runners were saying to each other and who they were who are these guys what are the names of the captains what are the names of their of their boats where where do they go um what do their networks look like she was essentially mapping a hidden criminal underworld uh, network, throwing light on the dark. Uh, this is this is this is the discipline that we call counterintelligence. I mean, mm-hmm. she, she, counterintelligence, the art of um, figuring out what uh, a hidden network of of spies is saying to each other. Counterintelligence is in the news uh, every day today because of the Russia Trump Russia mm-hmm. investigation. That that began as an FBI counterintelligence uh, investigation. What are these spies saying to each other? Just trying to figure it out. But a simple oh. statement that, uh, you know, and then Elizabeth went to work doing code breaking for the Coast Guard of messages by rum runners just sounds ridiculous without the whole story of right. how huge the rum running business was, why it was that the IRS was involved, why it was that the Coast Guard was an important part of the IRS, why it was that the Coast Guard got involved with code breaking of all things sure. uh, was because of this, because the story was the enterprise was so huge. And I, le- I learned about that too. Is sort of the the primacy of the Treasury Department in the 1920s yeah. and 1930s, which is really yeah. interesting. So the Treasury Department, um, its agents were called T men, yes, uh, as as opposed to the G men of the FBI. And so if you start to look at it through the lens of T men, it's actually um, the Treasury Department is actually then uh, and now an intelligence community all its own. It's a huge department that contains six different. Uh, mm-hmm. intelligence agencies I, i'll see if i can list them is narcotics um prohibition irs secret service coast guard and um customs and, and customs so it had six law enforcement agencies they all uh needed to do the work uh, uh at some point of of breaking hidden messages and yet there was no uh code breaking department within the treasury so elizabeth became kind of like the nexus for all six of these agencies, whenever any of these agencies, whenever any of these team men needed mm-hmm. a, a message solved, they would uh, the word was send for Mrs. Friedman and she'll solve mm-hmm. it. And so she, <laughs> she became she became kind of the, uh, uh, you know, the touch point for all for all of these places. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the volume of what she was doing was so impressive to me. Like you said, it was a, it was a massive operation uh, rum running and it required a massive response, even though she only had um, one clerk. 
yeah. uh, between right. she only had one uh, staff staff person beneath her from 1925 to 1931, which is incredible to think about. So for six years, Elizabeth and this this clerk typist, another woman, these two women were handling the entire code breaking burden of of fighting the rum war for the U.S. government. And it, and it involved <laughs> it involved solving about 20,000 different rum yeah. messages a year. Yeah. And if you think about that, that's, that's a lot. lot. That is a lot. That's a lot. 20,000 a year. Yeah, you break up not, your and day. It's not computerized. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking a computer. I mean, everything is computers today, but this is before the digital computer. And so it, all, all you had to work with was, you know, your pencil, your paper and your mind. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just and, pencil and, pencil and, and paper course, actually mean pencil and paper too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like they, they, you know, um, Elizabeth eventually, and, and I guess William too thought, you know, more people need to know about this and they, they're working on a book, they created classes, right? So, yeah. So, so from the very beginning of their career, they were <laughs> called upon to teach uh, code breaking just because there were so few code breakers. So even starting in world war one, um, you know, about a year after Elizabeth first learned to break code, she became a teacher of, you know, a hundred uh, young army captains teaching them how to break codes at Riverbank. And that yeah. that teaching continued all, all throughout their career because, you know, they were they were two of the primary experts in America. Um, they, so they had the they had the the uh, character of of researchers, scientific researchers is, is something we can learn about. They learn things, and when you learn things, you tell people about things, and you teach people about it. You share that as much so. as they could. I think so, <laughs> and, and that's, that's an interesting thing to point out. I, I and I always felt very strongly that they were fundamentally mm -hmm. teach, teachers and scientists at heart, and they and mm -hmm. and like you say, they they wanted to share uh, their knowledge, what they could. Uh, a lot of things they couldn't share, you know, a lot of things they had to keep secret, but um, they also uh, all their lives wrote about um, different aspects of code breaking, because I think they thought that, you know, in a democracy, uh, people need to know what the government is doing. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can't share specific details about, you know, secret investigations, um, which they never did, at the very least, uh, people in a democracy ought to know uh, s sort of what the government, uh, what kind of science the government is applying and uh, what they wanted people to understand code breaking and to be able to play around with it. I mean, they always they always had fun with it. They 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 to them, code breaking was a game uh, always. I mean, they they would um, send holiday letters to their friends that were <laughs> some ori original types of puzzles. You know, they, they would they would send uh, uh, they would send uh, little cryptograms to their, to their to their friends at the holidays that that uh, their friends would then solve, and there would be a holiday message. Some of these were so elaborate. I would be researching, you know, uh, some aspect of their lives <laughs> in the archive uh, where they left their papers in Virginia, and I, all of a sudden I would come across this like little puzzle, and I would have to pause for an hour to try to figure it out. Like, <laughs> like what 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 are they, what are they trying to say here? And I, and I would just get engrossed with it. Um, <laughs> and and they were really fun, but um, and and they they held these uh, cipher parties all through the 30s. They they would uh, invite people over to their house, and you know Elizabeth would cook like a, an elaborate five course dinner, and the menu yes. the menu would be themed around uh, uh, crypto things, and so you you would have to solve a little a little cryptogram to get your uh, to get your uh, appetizer, and then solve another one to get your main course. And, uh, yeah. uh, I, you know, I remember the Blue Point oysters. Yeah. Right. And there, there was a, there was a little uh, there was a, a a wife an army wife who came to one of the parties and was worried that she wouldn't be able to solve anything and all of the men were sitting around the table trying to solve this little puzzle that was written in a uh, uh, little little period dots of blue pen and, and it all of a sudden it occurred to her oh blue points they're, they're gonna <laughs> blue point oysters. she got she got the answer when all of these uh, sort of like crypto officers for the army had 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 struck yes. out so, uh, <laughs> but yeah I mean um, they were. Uh, they were teachers to the extent that they could teach. And then after World War II, um, what happened is uh, the government had a very different view of, of, mm -hmm. of what was uh, okay to share publicly about mm -hmm. the science of code breaking. And this was, you know, in the 1950s, the Red Scare, McCarthyism, um, you know, and the beginning of the Cold War. And uh, everything in Washington kind of shut down and became much, much, much more secret. There was much more classification. And uh, this really troubled uh, William and Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and um, you know, to the extent that they pushed back, they were uh, they were kind of ostracized, and uh, ultimately they became estranged from the government after a, a really sad uh, incident yeah. in, in 1958. 
when the NSA, which which was an agency that you know we, we kind of skipped over some of the World War II timeline, but that's all, but that's all right. Uh, okay, the, we're you know, gonna NSA, get back to that. We're about we're to get back to it. But and NSA NSA is you know an agency that that they I mean they're kind of like the Adam and Eve of the NSA, right? Like mm -hmm. they they helped to you know they laid the groundwork for it. Williams army unit that he started in 1930 became the core of the nsa when it was founded in 1952 you know they helped to build this thing and then the nsa turned on them in mm -hmm. 1958 it came to their house their private house and took um you know boxes of their own files from their own private library and reclassified them including things going all the way back to world war one which the freedmen's found um you know humiliating embarrassing and and, yeah. and intolerable from the standpoint of of just um sort of the democratic urge and and uh uh, you know, <clears throat> feeling that that certain things should uh, should be public in a democracy, and so at that point they uh, they started to think about how they could protect their papers from the government and mm -hmm. make them available for, to future generations of researchers. And the only reason that I was able to write this book, really, and other people have been able to write about the history of American code breaking, is because the Freedmen's, as a middle finger to Uncle Sam, decided <laughs> to give all of their papers to a private library in Virgi mm -hmm. or Virginia, and that's why I could go in. Mm -hmm you know, three years ago and start to look at uh, look at their their papers because they had that foresight and they wanted people to know the story. It's amazing. So so they were <clears throat> I'm sorry. So they were they were only code breakers. And in fact, I remember on Twitter, um, I had promoted your book just before it came out. And someone said something about Simon Singh, because of course, he wrote the code book. Sure. Yep. And Simon Singh pipes in and says, our office doesn't make them, we only break them. Right. That's what, so, that's what Elizabeth said um, uh, in the run up to World War II. It was somebody, somebody approached her and asked her, her team to, uh, uh, to make a series of codes. And, and she, she quipped, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't make them, we only break them. But, okay, so before we commit totally to World War II, which yeah, yeah. is a huge thing, I wanted to, to know for a bit, uh, Elizabeth had a brief period of celebrity thanks to the rum running work yes. and the trials that followed. And... Uh, well, that was a very interesting episode too, and so there was a there was a little moment when people actually knew about her. And did people really believe that she? A lot of people didn't believe still that she was the one doing all of this, right? Well, I think I think people started to believe when they saw her appearing at trials, testifying mm -hmm. against gangsters, and this this started to happen in the early 1930s. So um, Elizabeth, in her in her work uh, on the Rum War, she would solve these messages of rum runners. And then the uh, prosecutors would want to put these guys on trial based on her solutions. That meant that she had to, excuse me, she had to appear uh, uh, in front of a jury and explain how she had gotten these solutions. Because if she didn't go and testify and, and explain the science of code breaking and, and convince a jury that these solutions really were the real words mm -hmm. of rum runners, that she had essentially stolen their thoughts. Uh, if, if she didn't explain that, it just seemed like magic. Yeah. And, and if she didn't explain it, then it was very easy for defense attorneys to come in and say, oh, this is all just gobbledy. This is all just mumbo jumbo. All made up. There's, there's no science here at all. This is this is uh, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. so, so prosecutors would call in Elizabeth and she would get on the stand and she would have some fierce, uh, you know, criminals of her day. And she explained to the jury you know, what's, what code king was, what the science was, and how, how she did all of these things. She, you know, she went face to face with Al Capone's attorney at a famous trial in New Orleans <laughs> in 1933, you know, facing down more than, more than 20 agents of this huge uh, rum syndicate from Vancouver, Consolidated uh, Exporters Corporation, you know, and, 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 uh, and she beat them. And she, you know, she beat these guys again and again. Uh, you know, she she got she got convictions, and then and then um, and then she would you know get her get her bag. I mean, she always she always appeared. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, at some of these trials, she would wear like a uh, at the, at one of the trials, she wore a pink dress and a and a pink hat with a flower pin <laughs> at the brim. I mean, it was for for, for newspaper reporters, it was irresistible. It was a, absolutely had total headline material, and she became a front page story because of these spectacular testimonies. Um, you know, I mean, they called her the pretty little woman who protects the United States, pretty, <laughs> pretty you know, a pretty government code reader, um, a, a pretty government script analyst. I mean, she she was big news and um, she didn't she didn't particularly like it because uh, she uh, she hated journalists. She, she thought journalists were sort of like a lesser tribe of uh, <laughs> she, she thought they, they, they their code, uh, uh, professional code was less rigorous than hers. And she was <laughs> probably right about that. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, she 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 uh, she was a very modest person, and she didn't really like uh, um, sort of star worship, and and it made it made her very uncomfortable. And uh, and I think I think when you know toward World War II, when she began uh, to work on this ultra secret project for the government, and she was no longer allowed to appear in public and talk about her work, I think it was kind of a private relief for her because she had she had not really enjoyed her period of celebrity, but she was very famous for a time. Amazing, amazing. We're dumbfounded. Well, okay, so here we are in World War II, and uh, and we can talk about how that got started and how that sort of separated William from yeah. That's going to be my question. From Thank Elizabeth, you. yeah, and then how they continued to grow apart until you had, you know, the most poignant story sort of at the end of this where they had both done amazing things, none of which they could talk about with each other. Yeah, it was difficult. <laughs> uh, so they were both working for different parts of the government on very important, high-stakes, secret projects mm. that had to stay at work. So William, um, during World War II, was running an army team that was breaking the cipher machines of the Japanese government. The Japanese were um, giving <laughs> diplomats uh, a cipher machine. Uh, it was kind of like the Japanese version of the Enigma machine, if you've heard mm -hmm. of Enigma. Yes. Um, cipher machine, for those who don't know, is, is, is like, a, like a typewriter with sort of a mechanism inside that that changes one letter to another in a very complicated way that can't be guessed uh, mm -hmm. by, an, by an adversary through brute force methods. So um, William and his team ultimately uh, broke this Japanese cipher machine despite having never seen one, uh, a picture of one, uh, been, been able to uh, you know, take one apart. They just kind of guessed at it by, by, looking at the, um, uh, by looking at the garbled text that it spat out and they were correct. They were able to break into this Japanese diplomatic machine uh, called Purple, and um, in doing that, they uh, they got a window into uh, what Japanese military uh, and diplomats were were thinking and planning to do in the war, and uh, also a window into uh, the sort of Nazi strategy because whenever Japanese diplomats would would talk to their Nazi counterparts. Uh, William and his team were able to read the read the messages, and so uh, this gave the Allies an incredible edge uh, all through the war, and um, and and resulted in uh, probably prevention of a lot of Allied deaths, and and probably ended up shortening the war. So it was a huge success that William had uh, with his army team. And meanwhile, while William was doing that, Elizabeth was working for a separate part of the of the government. <laughs> um, she she was working with uh, a team at the Coast Guard. So uh, remember, I, I said that it, you know between 1925 and 1931, she only had one uh, mm -hmm. person beneath her. In 1931, they finally allowed her to create a proper code-breaking team in the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> in World War II, that's that's where she was. She was she was working with this team that she had had launched, that she had created, that she had built. She had trained the code breakers. A lot of them were young men. They worked for her. She was their boss, um, which was incredibly unusual in in, in mm -hmm. the government or really in, yeah. in all of society at the time for a woman to be the boss of men as a technical leader. It was just unheard of. Um, but she was she was unique. She was exceptional. And um, and so she was leading this leading these men uh, uh, working on this team at the Coast Guard. And, and they were um, they were intercepting and solving the radio messages of Nazi spies who were creeping into the Western Hemisphere. Uh, particularly in South America, setting up bases and clandestine radio stations. And Elizabeth's job uh, and the job of her team was to um, do the same thing that she had done with the rum war um, to intercept these radio messages, solve them, and should try to figure out who these Nazi spies were and what they were doing and, and ultimately how to, how to try to stop them. And it's, it's only because she had all of this rum experience that, uh, that she was called upon to do this. It was, again, it was kind of like an accident of history. Stuff mm -hmm. happened. Stuff um, happened. You know, it wasn't that she set out to uh, hunt Nazi spies. It's just that uh, the Nazi spies happened to be using very similar kinds of radio equipment and codes as the rum runners. And so mm -hmm. when World War II uh, came around, uh, you know, Elizabeth was ready to go. And um, there was no one else in government who had that ability. The FBI um, didn't have a code breaking team. Uh, all they had was essentially sort of like a crime lab where they analyzed bullet fragments and that sort of thing. And so the FBI was completely in the dark. Uh, about what these Nazi spies were saying to each other in these in these secret uh, clandestine radio messages, and so Elizabeth was ready to go, and she and her team, uh, you know, monitored 
about 50 of these uh, Nazi radio circuits ultimately solved about 4,000 Nazi spy messages. So, so Elizabeth working at the Coast Guard, William working at the Army, in the end of the day, they would go back home and they couldn't talk about about what they were doing. And, mm-hmm. you know, their, their joke was that, you know, for national security purposes, they had to sleep in separate beds. <laughs> and it was a sad thing. They, they, had, they, I, they had to keep certain things in their life compartmentalized. And I think it, I think it was... Uh, it was it was a burden for them, as as mm-hmm. you would imagine it would be for any couple to not be able to, to to talk about these these things with each other and not be able to get that support. They'd always been so close, always had such such a uh, an intimate kind of intellectual bond, and yet they had they had to keep these parts of their lives separate. And I think uh, I think it it ended up exacerbating a problem that mm-hmm. that became more severe for them as the years went on, which was William William was a sick man. He was yeah. uh, he suffered from probably bipolar disorder and uh his mental uh uh health deteriorated during world war ii um he was hospitalized for several months at walter reed general hospital hospital in the in the psychiatric ward after a mental breakdown um uh, after his team successfully broke purple and uh for the rest of their lives he 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 would uh, sort of spiral into periods of mm-hmm. depression that were so severe that um he had to be hospitalized and ultimately uh attempted electroshock therapy um to try to get it get a handle on it and and i think that um i think that it that it was probably tougher for him uh because he wasn't able to um he wasn't able to talk about these things with the person in his life who was the most important to him which was a it little- seems like it had to have been been really tough because we we learned very nicely that that they spent so much of their time thinking with one brain while they were at Riverbank right. and oh, developing yeah. all these things and having these these co-joined timelines to to finally get to where he he and his team break purple and they can't he can't talk about it. She's solved three Enigma machines during the war and put away all these Nazi conspiracies. They can't talk about that. And J. Edgar Hoover takes credit for everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, what do you, you, know, what what do you is, say? I mean, it's 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 um it's uh I think that's the central you know if there is a tragic element of their lives, I don't see them as tragic people. I, I feel like I feel yeah. like they're American heroes, uh, you know, wondrous, yeah. uh, creative, uh, original. Um, I mean, personal heroes to me for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if there is a tragic element to their, to their life, it's it's that it's that it's that be, by doing their duty for America, they yeah. were they were driven apart simply mm-hmm. because they had to, they had to compartmentalize uh, different aspects of their lives um, due to government regulations. And that, that is, that is, that is a sad thing. I, I mean, if, I, I write in the book um, that after the war, they, they found a way to combat that. And this is one of, this is one of my favorite things about them is that, um, you know, after the war, they decided that, that they had, they had been kept apart. Uh, by their work for too long, they wanted to get back together and, and do a, do a project together again and work together again, and so they they did this very th- this thing to me that is very moving, which is they they wrote a book together. Mm-hmm. I, I would find that moving because I'm a writer, <laughs> I'm a writer right, right. Books, right? But uh, but they wrote a book together um, called the Shakespeare Cipher is Examined. That is. Um, Essentially, it's them going back into their past, going back into their early days at Riverbank, analyzing the theory of the crazy rich guy that there was secret messages hidden in in the works of Shakespeare. Not only his theory, but the theories of all kinds of other people who believe similar things. And they, they one by one, Elizabeth and William kind of rip these theories apart uh, in very kind of like polite diplomatic language. Uh, they they just savage uh, the, this whole class of of ideas that there were hidden messages in Shakespeare and it, it is it is a it is a wonderful I would recommend anybody to buy and read this book it's really fun to read wonderful um, witty uh, like surprisingly hilarious at times and um, and that's how that that's how they got back to each other yeah. after after the trauma of the wars that is that they wrote this book together about about Shakespeare and kind of getting their revenge on on the uh, on the uh, lunatic uh, uh, Gilded Age tycoon who originally uh, kind of made their lives difficult. I, I wrote down that you wrote, the Freedmans wrote with a ruthless honesty because that's who they were as people. Yes, always. Their, their yeah. personal motto was um, knowledge is power, which was, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a, a statement of Francis Bacon. 
uh, mm -hmm. yeah. who was, who was the, supposedly the guy who had written Shakespeare. <laughs> they didn't believe that, but they, they liked Bacon's uh, motto, knowledge is power. William adopted that um, as his own uh, creed. And I think Elizabeth believed it too, mm -hmm. to, the, to the extent that, um, you know, uh, when, when, when William died in 1969, uh, Elizabeth had that motto carved on his on his headstone in Arlington mm -hmm. National Cemetery, and and she's buried in the same plot. And so when you go and visit the Freedmen's um, uh, gravesite today, uh, and you look at the headstone, what you see is uh, is that motto: "Knowledge is power." They they just did not give an inch their entire lives in the pursuit of truth. Um, they were they were honest, uh, 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 ruthlessly honest about their own work in a way that I, that I think is really inspiring and mm -hmm. uh, and reflects. Uh, and and show and shows that they are scientists, right? right. Is, is, you guys are scientists. I mean, I, yeah. I, w would you say that this is this is kind of this is one of the central things, as I understand it, about the scientist creed, right? Is that you're you it have is. to be you have to be honest with yourself first and foremost. Well, Fein, Feynman would always tell us that that science is not perfect, but it's the best way we have to keep from fooling ourselves. Absolutely. And if if anybody understood that, it had to be the Friedmans, who had to avoid just making crap up out of the secret messages they were trying to read. They had the Shakespeare things that they finally decided were crap. Elizabeth had to go to court and convince people that she wasn't just making things up. If anybody could be susceptible to seeing, you know, making things up and seeing crap and stuff, it's got to be code breakers. <laughs> and, and they were, you're right, they were pretty ruthless and tough with themselves about, about avoiding that. Yeah, and and honestly, and in the last over the last couple of years of researching this book, I've 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 felt that the culture is moving in the other direction. <laughs> that uh, they're they're dangerous. Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. They're, 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 you know, you see, you see, you read the news, and you definitely see the dangers of of uh, believing what you want to believe and tricking yeah. yourself into seeing what you want to see. And so, for me, learning about the Freedmen's, <laughs> reading their letters, reading their papers was was. Um, you know, uh, it was a bomb. It was, uh, it was a comfort, and and uh, so are are you saying solace. that that Elizabeth's story has relevance for modern readers in today's times? <laughs> I, I may be saying that. I may. Well, you know, I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want to whole, do anything. Yeah. <laughs> the the whole thing of women in STEM is right. you know mm -hmm. just to show there's this woman, and you do not shy away from saying she's got two kids and how she doted mm -hmm. on them to the extent she she did while conducting this job and i felt like you know she sort of had it all you know yeah, yeah i think um i mean she would she would go and testify she would take the train she would testify against gangsters <laughs> on the witness stand you know in the in the pink dress and the and the, the flower uh pinned to the hat then she would take the train back home and um you know, take her kids out to uh, Saturday morning tea and do uh, crossword puzzles with them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and oh yeah, and you've you've included many letters to the children back and forth between them, and yeah, it was just such a marvelous picture of the woman. The entire book is really good, and I'm really glad you wrote it. And I do want to get back to you know the fact that you wrote these two very different books. Sure. To to this one. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like this book is more of a fit or do you feel like you're just constantly changing and, you know, your next book could be completely different again? Uh, yeah, I've always sort of responded to the material uh, in my career is, is uh, you, you have as a writer, as a researcher, a kind of uh, visceral or, or instinctive reaction mm -hmm. to material that you discover. And, you know, I, I had that uh, the very first day I started reading. Elizabeth's letters is, uh, I mean, she, her voice on the page just leapt out at me. It was so, so funny, witty, warm, sometimes sarcastic, sometimes very bitchy, um, <laughs> you know, appealingly so. And, um, and I just felt that uh, this was a story that had to be told. And the more I dug, um, I, you know, I kept, it kept on opening into these you know, stranger and more surprising worlds, which is what mm -hmm. you want to, ha to have happen as a, as a writer. You want your subject to start feeling bigger and bigger mm -hmm. instead of smaller and smaller. And, 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 um, and, and that happened, like, like you said, stuff, stuff happened and stuff mm -hmm. kept happening. And, um, you know, I got to the point, uh, a couple of times where, you know, I was looking for a trove of documents. I wasn't sure if I could find, then, then I would be there in the library, um, 
and I, and I would find something and I would realize what it was. And you, and you're sitting in a special collections room, all the people <laughs> around you have like, have their little, have their, uh, you know, lights and they're, and they're very sort of, you know, their station set up, just show. And it's very quiet. And you, and you just want to, you just want to <laughs> scream in excitement and be like, yeah, I found, I, you, you wouldn't believe what I just have here. And, and, uh, and you can't do that because people will yell at you. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but there were moments like that kept occurring all, all throughout the research. Uh, process which told me i was kind of uh, on the right track and and uh you know and honestly was really motivating and and, and it pushed me toward uh toward the finish line to uh to complete this thing get the get the story out and and get people uh get people you know reading it and hopefully talking about it and yeah. not not to be too ridiculous about it but she is a story for the times that i you not only did it come about that enough things were declassified and available that you could research the story but it seems like we might be in a, an unusually good position right now to hear a really good story about someone as interesting and influential and necessary as elizabeth friedman i think so i think i think a couple of things came together one was one was that uh the records were declassified and another is that i, I like you said i think people are ready ready to hear stories mm -hmm. like this and and um you know, I, I, I think it's important to uh, to tell the stories of uh, of women and people of color who who've been ignored and, and and suppressed throughout history. I also think it's it's just the more accurate version of of what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's ju it's just what happened. Women were there. Um, yeah. Whenever you look back in the historical documents, women women were there doing this this technical work. And I think Elizabeth is a really powerful mm -hmm. uh, example of that. Is that um, she was there doing this. Uh, at a time when women weren't thought to be capable of doing it, and she was doing it at the at the very highest level, and mm -hmm. um, and one reason that we uh, we never heard about her before uh, is is simply because the story was uh, omitted or or sometimes suppressed by uh, powerful men around her. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, Am amazing. So uh, we've got two minutes left. Is there anything that uh, you wanted to bring up that we didn't raise as a question to you? before we sign up? I don't think so. I, I feel I feel like that was- You uh, did a great job. I feel like that was like, that was pretty, that was pretty fun. Uh, that, was, that was really fun. Uh, no, I feel like you, I feel like you covered all the bases and uh, oh, did okay. it in a nice organic way. And I'm glad that you guys reached out. It's, it's great to talk to scientists and uh, and I really appreciate your your support of it. Thank you so have much. We, oh, have we definitely. convinced people, Joanne and, and Jason, have we convinced people that they want to read this book and learn about Elizabeth and William Friedman? I, hope so i hope so like i said i loved it it's really ranking in one of my top books this year uh, just by the fact that i just didn't want to put it down and i felt like you had a good message and and you told it so well you cool know? i thank, thank so, you so i mean that means a lot to me and um you know people i hope that people watching this will uh buy it i mean i'm yeah. not gonna i'm just gonna yeah. try not to get too Christmas, promotional here holidays, but, you know, holidays are good it. no no holidays are coming up so yeah, it's a good uh, gift. Yeah, I think so. Uh, do you think you'll write another biography now that you've tackled this one, or Oof. not for a while? <laughs> it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's pretty difficult. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. No, I don't have an idea for another one right he's, now. He's he's okay. totally indifferent. Something will come along that will spark yeah. his interest. Yeah, we know exactly. That. And before right. you know it, the story will start growing. Probably so. Probably. Exactly. So. I hope. Um, <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, everybody. Uh, well, we are so glad Jason could come by and uh, help talk about the book, The Woman Who Sh Smashed Codes. Smashed, Smashed Codes. Um, and I love the cover. You know, I try not to comment on covers because they say you can't judge a book by the cover, but I love this one. Yeah, they did a beautiful job, I think. Yeah, it was very yeah. nice. Very, very nice. So thank you, Jason, for coming on and thank you for writing the book. I'm so glad. Uh, oh, thank it was you, a Joanne. Enjoyable thank you, sure. spot yeah. in my year. So, and we all need it. <laughs> yep. Wonderful. Right. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you guys yeah. so much. Thank sure you, thing. everybody, for joining us on Read Science, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.